Hello, my name is Aaron York and I'm the founder of Accepting Behaviour and in this YouTube video we're going to be looking at understanding anxiety in autistic children. Let's get into it. First I want to look into a brief journey into anxiety from the first documented case of anxiety to where we are now um, in all the different categories of, of the condition. Hippocrates was a Greek philosopher and he, he was the first known person to document anxiety in a person. And he says Nicanor, um, he talks about Nicanor and he says his affection when he went to a drinking party was fear of the flute girl. Whenever he heard the voice of the flute begin to play at a symposium, masses of terror rose up. He said that he could hardly bear it when it was night. But if he heard it in the daytime, he was not affected. Such symptoms persisted over a long period of time. Now, one of the things that's interesting for me with, with Nicanor is it's quite relatable to uh, autism, I think, you know, because um, all too common I hear, you know, parents will say to me, oh my God, you know, my kid is he's struggling so much at home. And then when he's in school, they're saying he's totally fine and there's no issues and we don't know what to do. And it's quite interesting, isn't it, how, how this is exactly how Nicanor was. It's okay some moments in the day, but then not others. Um, so maybe, I don't know, maybe Hippocrates was onto something here. And then jump forward to Sigmund Freud. He wrote about a little boy named Hans, who after being terrified by a horse in the street, was developed a strong fear of horses. And Freud believed that fear was actually unconsciously a fear of the boy's father, relating to his loving feelings about his mother. Uh, I'm not going into the Oedipus complex here, but uh, Freud w was, uh, you know, gave a lot to psychology and, and, and we are where we are today as a result of a lot of his work, uh, whether we agree or not agree. Um, he's a very influential bloke. Um, and the, this DSM, I'm going to talk about the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So this is the book that uh, academics will refer to with professionals who diagnose um, young people or children or adults with a condition. So anxiety is now in the DSM. Um, and Freud was the first one who, who coined the term uh, anxiety disorders and all the different terms within it in the DSM-1 and the DSM-2. And then in 1980 in the DSM-3, we see that new disorders around anxiety begin to appear, such as panic disorder, GAD and PTSD. And if you don't know, GAD is a generalized anxiety disorder and PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder. And jump to where we are now, um, major contributions of the DSM regarding anxiety is that it's now grouped into three. So we've got anxiety, OCD and trauma with stress-related disorders. So that's that's where we're at now, from Hippocrates all the way to, to you know, it now being a diagnosable condition. So we've come a long way, but we're still confused. Um, you know, just over a hundred years ago, there was no clear tidy categories of psychological problems. So anxiety might have been ignored or misunderstood as some vague kind of craziness, but nobody would have been able to have done much about it. Uh, my mum, when she was 11, uh, she had a horrific thing happen to her and, and she was um, placed in a ment mental asylum and she escaped and went to live with uh, my auntie. I mean, my mum's life, bless her, could be a, a Hollywood movie. <laughs> I, I guess we all say that about our mums. Um, but where are we today? And then how does anxiety um, connect or not connect to autism. So I've taken this from the mentalhealth.org um, uh, site that kind of just gen groups all the, the those categories we talk about in the DSM. So we've got generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, phobia, PTSD and OCD. Um, generalized anxiety disorder seems to be the most popular one and the, and the difference between generalized anxiety disorder and panic attacks or panic disorder is, is that you don't get as many panic attacks. Um, I suffered with panic attacks for years and years and I, I was diagnosed as a, uh, an autistic um, person when I was in my 30s and I had lived all through my teenage years, all through my childhood, all through my early adulthood with panic attacks constantly. I'd have, you know, four or five a day when I was in my bad times and uh, I don't have them now anymore because uh, I do something, something that I'm going to share with you later. Um, but generalized anxiety disorder means that you're just generally anxious all the time. Uh, and I find that's where autistic children sit for me. Um, they're generally anxious. 
I do see them having meltdowns. Oh my God, of course, yeah. Um, but generally, I find that, that, that they don't have as many panic attacks like a panic attack is categorized. Um, it's mainly general anxiety and then it will hit a peak and then the panic attack will occur. So how does all this relate to anxiety and autism? Where does autism fit in all this? Well, the best way to find out if you want to know anything about anything, you know, in, in science is, is to look at what we call a meta-analysis. So all, all a meta-analysis means is that uh, researchers take loads of studies on a specific topic and they group all the findings together um, and these guys did a meta-analysis on 83 studies in 2017 and they identified that the people who are autistic autistic young people have significantly higher levels of anxiety compared to the general population and i'm sure most of uh, the autistic families out there and autistic children and autistic teachers and education people who listen to that will, would most likely agree with this um, but but it's quite interesting because the thing is if anxiety and autism aren't related they're separate there's always this argument are they a comorbid condition of autism or is it a co-occurring condition of autism now this le it leads me onto a question that i'm always asking myself do we need a different approach to supporting anxious autistic children you know what i mean by that is do we need to be thinking differently are traditional anxious anxiety strategies um effective enough Personally, I think we do need a different approach, which is why I've done this, this little session for you today. And I will be sharing later what, why I think that. But first, I want to look at traditional anxiety strategies. Now, a, an autistic kid, whatever age, um, who's struggling, will be supported by school or hopefully medical or the NHS. And both will use or tap into both professionals, whoever's involved with the, with the young person, will look at the, an anxiety toolbox and they will dip into this anxiety toolbox. And if I was to, to kind of sum up traditional anxiety strategies in this toolbox, it would be um, face your fears or always fear them. You know, if a child's anxious, they need to be exposed to the thing that makes them anxious because then the anxiety will go away. That's a general view, isn't it? And most people would agree. Face your fears, or always fear them. Um, face the fear and do it anyway. Uh, the great book by Susan Jeffers. Now, I'm not saying none of that stuff doesn't work. I faced fears uh, in, say, like my music and stuff. You know, when I was a kid, I was trying to make it as a pop star. You know, I'd face those fears, but I'm not talking about that kind of thing here. Um, but generally, a traditional anxiety strategy support would have this embedded in them. Face it, you know, and we've got here Eleanor Roosevelt. Do something every day that scares you. We all can relate to that kind of thinking. But we're talking about autism here. And if I was to take that quote and think of it from an autistic point of view, it would be this. Do nothing every day that scares you. Um, I know what you think, but that's that's me. The less things I can do that scare me now, the more happier I am. But anyway, let's look at this anxiety toolbox. So this is just a list of the things that you get from the guidance on from the NHS. Uh, if you can go into the NICE guidance. And it says, try talking about your feelings to a friend or family member or professional. Use calming breathing exercises. Swimming, running, walking. Of course, these are great things, aren't they? Um, find out how to get to sleep if you're struggling. Eat a healthy diet. Consider peer support and search relaxation and mindfulness apps. That's great. And these are uh, uh, strategies that can work for many, many people. Okay, but we're talking about autism here. And if I'm looking at this from an autism point of view, try talking about your feelings to a family member or friend or professional. It's not happening, is it? <laughs> to a lot of kids, they're not gonna talk. That's their whole anxiety issue, talking with people. Use calming breathing exercises. Hmm, yeah, but if a kid's in uh, what they call a meltdown or a shutdown, going up to them and asking them to do some breathing, um, I've not seen it really help. It can help, of course, and please don't think I'm, I'm, I'm saying none of this helps. Of course it does. We're talking about autism. Exercise. Yeah, great. But how many kids that are having a meltdown swimming or walking are going to stop and go, hold on, let me just do some walking and see how I feel after. Kind of not going to happen, is it? Yoga. I remember trying this with my son and uh, tried some meditation with him and he just freaked out. I had a major panic attack and uh, he said his brain was going too noisy and he just freaked out. And we were like, hmm, not going to try that again. Struggling to sleep. 
you know what? I don't know any family that I support or work with in school and out of school that don't have this as their number one issue. And the reason I find is because autistic kids don't sleep. They're not designed to sleep that way. Um, but, you know, that's another session in another topic. But giving that as a strategy, just work out what it is that, that you get. It's not going to work, is it? Eating a healthy diet? Yeah, it's great unless you only eat beans. Um, consider peer support. Same thing. I don't know if you, got str if you don't want friends. Well, you're not going to talk to anyone, are you? And then the mindful apps. Well, you know, they can work for some and not for others. So, uh, you know, medical is about facing fears. It's about CBT, which again is a good strategy, can work. Breathing is great. Learning about feelings, all this kind of focus. That's what kids get given to them as strategies to help them if they're anxious. So let's look at strategies in school for, for autistic kids that are anxious. Generally, I hear this all the time. You know, kids that, that are struggling to be in school for whatever reason, the, the go-to approach is bring them in. They'll be fine once they're in school. They are fine once they're in school. And then, you know, a lot of teachers will say to me, oh, but I give them a red card to show me, to put up and show me if they're feeling anxious or if they need some help. And yes, of course, at a low level, guys, that is a good thing to use. But we're talking about fully blown anxious kids here. Um, you know, that is a general, I say, oh, if only they'd tell me, I would know then how to help. And that's probably true, isn't it? Exposure to social situations, that's a real common thing. For kids anxious, being in a group, give them a social group to go into, to improve it in some way. Face your fears, we always fear them, we've talked about that, and then regulate your emotions. So that's kind of the stuff that you're given as a kid, aren't you, in schools. Now, can be helpful for some kids. Of course it can, every strategy can. And this is the problem with autism, isn't it? Or the difficulties, I guess. Um, autistic children are all different. Some ideas do exist that are good in the toolbox and I use them, you know, and they can be effective in some situations. However, there's a problem. And the problem I identify in my work, both for a local authority advisor as an autism advisor and also as uh, in my accepting behavior stuff where I'm supporting families and, and giving them advice is this. There are too many who do not respond to the traditional anxiety support. So what do we do with those kids? They're the ones I'm interested in. For those kids that that, that traditional stuff works brilliant. Oh my gosh, isn't it? Wouldn't it be great if you could just give a kid some breathing activities to do and then they'll be fine for the day. <gasps> Amazing. Um, however, I don't see that. And I'm interested in that massive group of kids that I support that aren't responding to it. So I'm always having to think differently. Because look, what's the reality here? There isn't enough support in mental health. Um, my daughter, myself, you know, when she was four, we had to try and get her some mental health help. We had to wait 12 months. You know, what, what is it that we do? What, what do you do as a family after, you know, do you just kind of say to the kids, oh, don't worry. Um, just be okay for 12 months and then when the help comes, it'll all be fine. It's not gonna happen, is it? Kids need help now, immediately. And I know that's not anyone's initial fault. I guess it's just a problem that we've got in society today. Uh, breathing, breathing is stupid. Um, that's what my daughter told me when we tried to give her some breathing exercises to do. And that's a common anxious, anxiety-driven, autistic response. Oh, breathing is stupid. Um, so, you know, what do you do with those kids that say breathing stupid? You're not going to give them uh, that, are you? Lack of acceptance of feelings. That's a real common one. Kids not knowing how they feel. Um, my daughter, again, ask her how she feels. She gets anxious because she doesn't know. So giving her some pictures or giving her, you know, a breakdown of emotions isn't going to help. It's about doing other things around emotions, isn't it? And this is just my view on this anyway, guys. Um, I can't say guys anymore, can I? People. <laughs> persons and then focus on fixing and this is just my opinion you know medical view of uh, autism there is a general view about it being fixed improve things stop this from doing improve that the child needs to do that parents need to do this it's all about an act an action of improvement because there's a deficit there that's kind of the view isn't it um Here's, here's uh, uh, this is just some research looking into that area, the, you know, the mental health professional area. And this guy did a study and it says basically mental health professionals and psychiatrists are generally not trained in recognizing and understanding autism, meaning services are unprepared to adapt support and treatment to this group. I've lived 
experience of this. And I agree totally with this finding. My son had loads of support, but it wasn't the right support because they didn't understand that his autism was always going to be there. You know, it was always about trying to improve it. And of course, that is what we're trying to do. And I am going to come share some things in a bit, guys, that will, will give you an option. I'm just trying to share how I see the problems we've got with, with, with anxiety today. Um, and I hear loads and loads of stories about this, you know, that the, the advice wasn't right and it was all about improving parenting or it's all about improving the child's behaviour. And it's not, I, I really don't think it is. And, and this, you know, this report shows that, that, that you know, they're unprepared to adapt because that is what's needed with autism, adapting. Um, let's look at school. You know, let's flip this on the head. She's not fine in school. Just because a kid will come into school and sit quietly all day and then go home and have massive meltdowns and crying and screaming and arguing with parents. That means that kid is traumatized by something and, and is most likely doing what the, you know we call masking or camouflaging. You can't, as educators, I can't myself, presume just because the kid's happy in my lesson and they go home and have a, if I, whenever a parent used to tell me, oh, my kid's cope, I, I, I would stop everything and I would be like, right, what are we going to do to support this family? How are we going to work this out? How are we going to look into what is going on? Could it be in school? Don't ever think as a teacher, if you are teaching and you're listening to this, that just because the kid's sitting there quietly, that they're okay. And it's not on your teaching at all. It's about us having an open mind and, an open, and a different way of viewing autism, which I am going to share in a second. Um, autistic children cannot self-regulate. Very rarely have I met a kid that is going to put up a red card. Now, again, if they're at a moderate need of help, you know, and they're generally OK and they're struggling with a lesson, you know, they're going to do it. But if they're in an acute state of anxiety, they don't want to be there. Someone's upset them or someone's looking at them. They're feeling embarrassed. They're not going to put their hand up and ask for help. They're going to sit there till the end of the lesson and then burst out of that lesson and then have an explosion outside. That's what happens. I see it all the time. And I think my advice for teachers is to don't presume an anxious kid is going to respond to a, a card to pick it up. Go and speak to them. Build a relationship up with them. Learn to identify when that kid's struggling and when they're not struggling. Because then you'll be able to know when she, he or she's in an issue. And you can quietly go and sit with them. Are you doing? You're all right. Do you want to go out for a bit? That's so much more effective than them bursting out and holding it in all through the lesson. Um, so don't always presume. Exposure, socialising, this is just my view on it. It can cause massive amounts of trauma. Just because a kid is finding it hard to be in a group, don't think well, that's going to be wrong for them in their life because that's generally what we call a neurotypical approach. You need to have friends and you need to socialise and it's good and healthy. It is for you, but it's not for a lot of autistic kids. And I find that you get a mix of kids. You'll get ones that want to socialise and that's different. So we do help them there gradually just building up maybe friendships and getting good kids that will support them or mentor them. But then you get kids that want to have friends because they think that that's what's right and then they'll get into trouble or they'll upset someone. And then you've got kids that don't want friends and then they're told that they need to have them and they're like, but I don't want them. And then it's seen, it's seen as a behavioral thing. Guys, it's healthy for kids that doesn't want friends. That's okay, because that's what they're telling us. Um, masking, we talked about that. Facing your fears, um, it can make anxiety worse and that's just my view on it. Uh, but let's look at a study, a recent study, um, looking into this uh, because there is a, 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 a lot of research out there that are saying teachers need a lot of training and support and that's not their fault and that's not our fault and we're doing what we can aren't we as professionals we're helping we're training there's lots of people out there trying to make a difference here um, but it says here the findings point to an underestimation of knowledge which indicates the need for additional resources and training to develop trainee teachers self-efficacy and confidence in their pedagogical blah blah blah, blah practice now um uh what that's basically saying is teachers still in 2019 and that's only a few years ago still need to be trained in autism to understand and to have that confidence to be able to say you know what that kid can't sit down in circle time i'm not going to give him a red spot and make him sit i'm going to just teach the kids in the class that it's okay that little Reggie can roll up and down on the floor at the back because that's how he's learning but that's a, a topic for another day um well, so what's the reality? Let's look at the reality of this. This is just my reality as a professional, as an autistic adult, and as a parent raising kids. I've got all different, you know, ways of thinking about this reality. And it is this. Most autistic children will just not get over their anxiety. 
it's not going to happen. So then what is the solution? So I've told you about things and traditional, I don't think traditional anxiety support can help with that heightened level number of kids who don't respond to anxiety support, the traditional stuff. So what is it that you can do then? What can we do? Acceptance based strategies. These are the best things. I use them all the time in all of my work. Um, now, if you know a traditional thing works, I'll try it. I'll, I, I get to know the kids first before I do stuff. But most of the time, you know what? They say once you've met one autistic child, you've met one autistic child and that not all strategies work for other kids. And I agree with that. But I must say acceptance is the one strategy. Personally, I believe helps every single child. So this is a strategy that can help anyone. Uh, you know, you might disagree, but tell me some kid that doesn't like to be accepted unless there's some, some, some trauma and we have to work on stuff. But the general view is acceptance. I, I've never seen it not work. Let's look at a case study to give you an example of uh, an acceptance based approach and how you do it. Right. The pajama kid. This kid I was asked to support in school. He, um, uh, to give you some background information, he basically, uh, the school didn't know what to do anymore. From out of the blue, he had stopped attending school and couldn't leave his house. He'd been refusing to go to school for about five weeks and he was too anxious to leave. And this came out of nowhere in the school said previously he was fine and they were just like, they didn't know what to do. So the general advice was, referring to the mental health professionals and 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 they did get involved quite quickly which was a good thing and um they uh the advice was that um he needed to go back to school and that when he was at home they needed to keep a school routine going so he needed to get up at school time and, and eat at dinner times because the the, the fear was that he, if he'll lapse and he'll fall into comfort too much and and no 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 we need to to make sure he doesn't do that he needs to get dressed he needs to not play his computer games he needs to eat well you know it was all about get him to school get him to school whatever you do get him to school. Um, and mum reported that one doctor felt that he was being manipulative towards his mum and the family needed to stop rewarding him at home. So this was the, you know, the, this is what we would look at as, as a medical model thinking. So it's a, a deficit. So there's something wrong with this kid. He's got anxiety, something wrong with him. We need to fix it. Um, and while he wasn't in school, they said he needed to get dressed and he needed, this was massive issue for him he needed to not wear his pajamas that's what they said he needs to get out of his pajamas the big problem with this kid hence the name pajama kid he loved wearing his pajamas <laughs> so that was a big big barrier for him um the school what did they say well they believed that when he was in school he'd be okay and he, he was okay and and there were days that he was fine in school or appeared to be fine in school um so they said whatever you do bring him to school and dad told me one story of a time where he felt so guilty about not bringing his kid to school and his mom did as well they were, they, they, the pressure was put on this family um not intentionally all this advice is good intentions isn't it they want to help this kid um they had to pick him up on his shoulder put him in a taxi the school was half a mile away <laughs> from their house um and his dad was crying on his shoulder and he said and his dad was tearing up when he's telling me he's saying like you know Dad, why are you doing this to me? And I was like, oh man. I said, look, stop that straight away. <laughs> I remember saying, don't do that again. Um, so looking at that advice, right? And I'll, I'll explain why I said that. Looking at all the general advice on facing his fear, exposing him to school, pushing him, keeping the routine, you know, um, you might think that's great advice. And I'm not here to say whether it is or not. What I'm here to say is, did it work? Cause that's what I'm interested in. Does it work? Here's, here's the outcome of that advice and guidance. Things got worse and then he started accessing nothing. He couldn't even be out the house. He'd locked himself in his room. He would refuse to come out. Um, so mum and dad just couldn't get into school anymore. The school just didn't know what to do. Um, the mental health team um, signed him off because they said he's not responding to their advice. Um, yeah, um, traumatized and anxious was what happened basically. He just got worse. Um, and it was really sad to see this because uh, I, I just, no one wants to see it, do they really? Um, so the school asked me to get involved, so I did. And I went in and I said to the school, look, let me just run a three or four week project. We'll take school pressure away. And let me just see from the home if I can build his, his resilience back, his confidence back, and then we'll see where we go. And, and thankfully they went, yep, let's go for it. So 
here's what I did. I removed the anxiety, first thing, very first thing. So you know there's the face, the fear, nah. I, with focusing on acceptance and acceptance-based strategy, you take it away, right? Uh, I told him, first time I met him, you don't have to go to school anymore, dude. You tell me what you want to do and we will work it out. And if you, at some point you want to go back, don't worry about it, you can. That's totally fine. You do not have to go to school and we're not going to talk about it. And that, that was clear. I told his mom and his dad and I told them, don't worry, the school are supporting this. So that took pressure off them. Oh, I remember it when I said, you know what? He doesn't have to go to school. They were like, oh, they were so relieved to hear it, you know? And um, I use this a lot with, with, with autistic kids and I'll explain why. Well, you'll see the impact of this in a minute. Um, because autistic children need control, okay? So if they're anxious, they need to not feel it. They don't want to feel anxious either. You don't want them to feel anxious. They don't want to feel anxious. And I found, or I find, that removing the anxiety is so powerful. And I said to this kid, I said, right, you do not have to go to school until you're ready. But another thing I want you to do, and he said, what is that? I said, I want you to be the boss. I said, you make the decisions. Me, you, mum and dad are going to follow what you want to do. In these sessions, we're going to do what you want to do. I want to help you find your way through this. And that was all I did. And I said about his gaming, I said, you play your games as much as you need, mate. All I need you to do is not bother your parents of a night. If, you know, be quiet if you can, wear some headphones. If you need it, you go on that game and you play it. He never got had any behavior issues. He loved his gaming. Um, it was his escape. And I'll, I'll show you later in the tips why I gave that advice. Um, Okay, and then the next two tips were, he can eat whatever he wants, whatever makes him happy. Now, I'm not a nutritionist, so please forgive me. Um, uh, it was a few weeks in this session, you know, that I was working with him, and, and I said, look, he's not eating anything else, just let him eat what he wants to eat. So if he wants to eat four pieces of toast, it's better than nothing. If he wants a macadies, just if it makes him happy, let's just do it. Because the whole focus in my uh, work with this kid and his family was to get him feeling happy about himself. So many autistic kids don't like themselves. And I do think it's because good, well-intended strategies are applied to them that actually damage them. And I think the more professionals that, that realize this, the more teachers and educators and parents that realize this, which is one of the reasons I'm doing this video, the, the more then we can prevent them from being so unhappy. And I don't think people are out there being horribly mean to these autistic kids. I just think that sometimes strategies aren't as good or effective as we think they are. So I said, let him eat what he wants. Um, and then the big thing, this was massive, right? This is where acceptance kicks in. I said, you know what? You know your pajamas, you like wearing your pajamas. He went, yeah, yeah. I said, you stay in your pajamas as long as you want, mate. If you want to get dressed one day, fine. But if you want to stay in your PJs, then that's what you're going to do. I remember this big beaming smile on his face. And his mum was smiling too, because that's what his mum wanted to do. But it's because the professionals were saying, no, he needs to get dressed, he needs to get dressed. Again, good, well-intended professionals were really trying to help. But they weren't listening to the kid. He wants to wear his pajamas. So I said, let him wear them. Okay. So we did, we had sessions, and the sessions revolved around me visiting him and just hanging out, talking about Marvel and you know, superheroes and whatever he wanted to talk about. It was, it was generally, you know, it wasn't right, let's do this worksheet. It was just chatting, talking, communicating, mentioning about autism, going in the garden, just generally um, developing a relationship with him. After two or three weeks, right, this is mind blowing. This is the profound effect of acceptance, okay? His mom said, oh my God, he wants to go back to school, only for an hour, but he's asked if he can go at dinner times to see his friends and just then come home. And I was like, okay, we'd not mentioned school at this point. I went, let's do it. I said, I'll come and I'll support and I'll be there in the, you know, the back of the room, just waving at him. Didn't care, I was there. He was smiling and he was happy. Um, and his mum said, I said, well, what was it? He said, it's because she said he was the boss. It gave him control. She said, um, he would say to me on the way to school, Mom, I don't have to go if I don't want to, do I? Mom's like, no, of course you don't. And that got him to school. Do you understand the difference here? It's about control. And I really do believe passionately giving the child who is anxious control by removing the anxiety. It's like it frees them up to find their way and then they get back on their path. It's profound, it really is. Um, 
so we went and then in time you know the school wasn't the right place for him and and, and uh, um, mental health got back involved and and we were looking focusing on getting him an education healthcare plan and finding him a school and we found him a good school and uh, about six months later my case finished with him and, and six months later I got a text from his mom and it just basically read Aaron he's doing great at his new school he goes every day he says I never thought we'd get in there thanks for all the support you gave us at a very stressful time in our lives can you see the difference with this kid with the traditional approach and then the acceptance based stuff? It really worked. And I have so many cases where acceptance is much more powerful than anything else I've ever used. So I hope that gives you a good example of, of, of what I mean now. Acceptance based strategies, right? I'm going to give you some tips that I use every day that work without fail. Honestly, some, you know, I'm saying without fail, but it's all around about acceptance. I really do believe, you know, you might disagree. You can't go wrong with acceptance. You really can't. It's not. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. It's not about letting them do what they want. No. Acceptance is harder because you're listening to what they want and you're helping them get that instead of thinking you know what's best. Really, it's about the kid knows what's best. And I find a lot of autistic kids, my children included, know what's best for them. We just need to help them and get on board and help them to achieve what they want. And some weeks, years, they may be completely in a state of confusion doesn't matter be on that road with them they will get there um, I really tr truly believe it so here's some tips right tip number one whenever you can remove the anxiety I've talked about that try it you know if your kid's freaking out uh, sitting at a dinner table and doesn't like it but you think he needs to sit because it's it's socially acceptable let him sit in his room or in the living room I do not eat with people I cannot um, one of my autism things is sensory issues. I've got major, major struggles with hearing the sound of people eating. Ooh. And Christmas Day for me is sitting on my own in the living room, watching telly while my family are in the kitchen, chatting and being social, whatever that is. And then after the food's gone, we all get back together again. Perfect. I'm in a happy place. Now, sitting when I was a little kid, I used to get sent to bed all the time because my parents, they didn't know that I had an issue uh, of disability, did they? They didn't know. Um, I couldn't sit at a table. My legs would be shaking. I'd be nodding and twitching. I couldn't cope. And I didn't know as a kid that I couldn't cope with the sounds. But do you know what I learned as a kid? That I'm naughty and I'm bad because my brain was just trying to cope with something. But my parents, who didn't know it better, they just would tell me off and send me to bed. They would tell me to sit on the naughty step or, or whatever they did. Um, and I just learned that, oh, I must be bad then. And I had, again, another time for that. But um, it really damaged me. Not that my mom and dad, they were brilliant parents. Um, anyway, tip number two. Don't try and stop the feeling, accept it. This is something for me. I used to have panic attacks all the time. This I haven't had a panic attack now for about eight years. Um, have a look at the DARE approach. It's about accepting the feeling of your anxiety. So you just say to yourself, you know what? I feel anxious today. I don't like it. I feel crappy and it's all right. Some days, right? It's not, anxiety is not about being strong or being weak. I'm a strong person. I'd like to think that I'm quite an optimistic person, but anxiety and depression, sometimes for me, I'm bedridden for days. I can't do anything, but I tell you, when I try and fight it, it gets worse. But when I accept it and I'm, I allow myself to be in that bed, I can get up then and I'm fine for, for the, until the next time. And that's just who I am. Anxiety is okay. Be okay with it. Teach your children to be okay with it because the more you fight it in autism and, and probably as well without autism, you know, the Deb uh, approach talks about it. The more you try and make it a thing and you're scared of it by getting rid of it, it just gets bigger, not more dangerous, but you just get, it just doesn't go. And I had years and years of that fighting my anxiety. Fight, 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 fight. And it never went. And now I'm like, I'm all right with it. I hate it. Don't get me wrong. But um, yeah, it's a really good tip. Tip number three leads on to tip number two, really. Um, learn about the parasympathetic system. I'm just going to briefly talk about it. You can go and research this because there's things like the vagus nerve and just how things work. It's the body's natural way of calming you down and always happens. So I used to have a panic attack and it would take me two or three hours to calm down. I'd be knocked about. But the brain, whenever you're in this fight, flight and freeze moment, whatever it is that you struggle with or your kid struggles with, your brain gets to a point where the anxiety has to stop. Whatever's going on, the meltdown has to stop. 
because then the parasympathetic system has to kick in because it's a natural way of releasing chemicals in the brain. So that's cut off. The, you know, when you, you'll see a kid, my son used to do this, he'd have a massive, massive meltdown and then he'd burst into tears afterwards. That's the parasympathetic approach, calming him down. And have a look at it because you can trigger it. Okay, there's certain things you can do. Using things like breathing and things. Just have a look. Honestly, it's brilliant. I, I'm a fan of it. I really am. Um, but it can help. But I think the reason I share this as tip number three is because when your kid is anxious, whatever, in class or at home, don't worry about them. Okay, they're going to calm down. Best thing you can do when a kid's in a massive meltdown is just be there with them. Don't try and stop them from doing it. Just, just keep them safe and wait for them to calm down because they will. Okay. Um, tip number four is a good one for any kid that whenever they get in the car, when you pick them up from school, how's your day? Ah, don't talk to me about my day. Ah, and then they're coming home from school. Hiya, how's school? Ah, they storm upstairs, throw their shoes at you. This is for those kids, right? Don't speak to them. Just literally leave them alone. My advice is half an hour to an hour. Don't talk to them. Let them come in the house. You can say hello. I'm not saying ignore them. Just let them go in their room. Let them do what they want. You can even say, all right, mate, dinner's at six. Or if you want to talk to your kids, you miss them. You could say, oh, man, my day's been this and that today. And just let them just and let them just walk off. OK, they need this transition time, this downtime. Um, even, you know, give them their iPad and their pajamas. The moment they walk through the door, there you go. See you in two hours. <laughs> Try it. It's brilliant because what you're doing is, is you're showing them that it's okay for them to de-stress and then come down when they're ready. It's a really good strategy. And then adding on to that, school is school, home is home, wherever you can, keep them separate. Now it's different if a kid is saying, I wanna do work and I'm stressing, I'm struggling, and of course, but just for you parents out there who think you need to educate your kids more because they're struggling at, uh, at school, nah. school is school, home is home. Trust me, we're talking about autism here. Let it be separate if you can. Um, and then the last tip, which is what I talked about earlier, screen time, gaming, and all this kind of stuff. Um, give it as much as they need. Um, and the reason is, I've been in this years now, and I've seen this, uh, you know, the traditional advice is, oh my God, it's got to get reduced. It's damaging, it's dangerous for their brain. And there are studies out there, of course, that are suggesting that. However, we're talking about autism again here. Um, a lot of kids need it, okay? And I find that my son, exam is 22 now, he will come and hang out with us for a couple of hours and then he'll go, Dad, I need to go. And he'll go to his, his flat and he'll just game all night and he's content and happy. And he has to be in his house by about half eight every day. And he needs it. Has it affected him mentally? No, not at all. It's healed him. It helps him. My daughter's the same. She's 10 and she needs to be on her iPad and we do not refuse that for her um, at all. And that, yeah, that's just us, you know, and as professionals, you know, what I find is the stress comes when you 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 limit them from it and then now the behavioral kicks in because, you know, is it any different to me binging Netflix? No, not at all. If I've had a bad day and I want to shut my door and binge Netflix, I'm going to do it. No one's going to stop me. Um, and it's the same thing because it heals us. And I do think gaming has a healing uh, thing about it. Now, I know you might agree, disagree or agree, and that's fine. And I'm not saying this is the ultimate way. I'm just giving you a tip. Try it or don't. It's up to you. But here's a study, and there's lots more coming out now. Oxford University 2020 study. Gaming can be good for well-being. And uh, if you go on my YouTube channel, there's a thing about gaming, about how it's good for problem solving and socializing, all sorts of stuff that you might not have thought about. You might be worrying that your kid's in his room just not being around anyone. Oh my God, it's so damaging for him because you think it's good for them to be around people. We're talking about autism. It might not be for your kid. And it's important that we let them know it's good if they want to be in their room because it's healthy, doesn't hurt them. Um, have a look at that study, it's really interesting. The only time I advise against it, or I will look at reducing it, is if a kid, not one, not a one-off, right? As if they're angry, or repeatedly throwing their iPad on the floor, or smashing their game box, or whatever they're playing, you know, that's when there's something else going on. And that's when, yes, of course, as a professional, I would be sitting with the kid and the family saying, well, what's going on? Is it the game he's playing? You know, I still would make it important that the game, you can't just stop it. You can't just take it away from them. It doesn't work. It can make it worse, especially if they're anxious about school or anxious about something. Taking away their thing 
uh, can actually be really damaging, which is why I say, you know what, if there's no behavior issues, let them have it as long as they need it. Um, that is it, guys. That is my general take on understanding anxiety in autistic children. I hope it helped. I hope you got something from it. Please subscribe to my channel because I'm always uploading things like this. And I'd love to hear what you think. Leave me a comment in, in, you know, in the post. Please be nice. Again, I'm just sharing my thoughts. Um, and until the next time, I'll, I'll see you uh, very soon. Thank you very much for following Accepting Behaviour.